Welcome everyone to the Healthy Lamoille Valley Coalition meeting. I'm Brian Duda, the Youth Substance Prevention Coordinator for Healthy Lamoille Valley. Uh, and this meeting is intended for many people, for many sectors, coming together for the common goal of reducing youth substance misuse, supporting positive activities, and using prevention science to create change. Tonight's topic is vaping prevention. We have a guest presenter, Marcella Bianco from Catch My Breath. We will be discussing the launching of our youth, youth and young adult vaping prevention work group. Now for a few more minutes on the state of vaping in Vermont, Lamoille County and why we should care. Here are some trends and data points about the state of vaping in Lamoille and Vermont that Luca DeRuza, a Lamoille Area Youth Council member, found in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So the trends he noticed for high school students from 2017 to 2019. There was a 17% increase in those who have tried an electronic vapor product from 37% to 54%. Vermont saw a 16% increase from 34% to 50%. There was a 16% increase in vaping in the past 30 day use, past 30 day use from 13% to 29%. Vermont saw a 14% increase from 12% to 26%. There was an 8% increase of those who tried flavored tobacco products from 24% in 2017 to 32% in 2019. Vermont saw a 6% increase from 21% to 27%. Uh, some other data points you found. 81% uh, of high school students said that they thought their parents, guardians feel it would be wrong or very wrong for them to use electronic vapor products. Vermont, it was 84%. In 2019, 33% of Lamoille County Middle School and 76% of Lamoille County High School students said if they wanted to get um, an electronic vapor product, it would be easy or sort of, very easy or sort of easy for them them to get. For Vermont, the number is 29% for middle school and 76 for high school. And finally, 53% of Lamoille County High School students always or most of the time see ads for cigarettes or other to tobacco products. In Vermont, that's 50%. On the state level, the Tobacco 21 law was enacted on September 1st, 2019. Three other laws re related to vaping and tobacco prevention have been passed over the past year. We want to recognize local representative Dan Noyes for being an ally of this work. There was also a legislative committee pre-COVID on banning flavored vaping products in Vermont. This is on the agenda for the upcoming legislative session. And now if you will look at the agenda, Hold on. All right, so welcome and introductions. Next, Marcella Bianca is gonna do the Catch My Breath vaping presentation. Then will be a quick state of vaping da data share. Why is vaping still an important issue? What are we doing locally and how, and how to get involved? And future coalition survey, what's important to you? I want to introduce our guest presenter, Marcella Bianco, who is the program director of Catch My Breath, a vaping prevention program. And I first um, encountered Marcella a couple of years ago, and then we encountered you, Marcella, um, at a conference. Um, and I was just um, really, I'm so thrilled to be able to bring you here to our coalition uh, to support our work and to see so many people on the coalition meeting tonight and to know that it's part of a series. This is the introduction piece and the launch of the 
work group, but then there's a more in-depth piece. And then there's also teacher trainings. And I know that we already have um, our uh, People's Academy middle level jumping in and, and uh, bringing the curriculum to our youth, which is amazing. So Marcella, I have All right. you. Well, thank you so much, Allison. Um, yes, it's been several years that we've been collaborating together, but great to, to meet everyone um, tonight. And well, I'm gonna talk a little bit and introduce myself while I, I attempt to pull up my screen share because you know how that works with, uh, if you've all been on a Zoom meeting or two, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it just has a mind of its own. So, <laughs> um, so I am, as I introduced, uh, as Allison introduced, Marcel Bianca, I'm the program director for the Catch My Breath program. So I had come to you with over 16 years of tobacco prevention and control. Uh, worked on a political came, uh, campaign back in 2006 for, um, in Florida when I worked with Cancer Society Heart Association Lung Association and campaign for tobacco free kids to restore tobacco prevention funding in the state of Florida. Um, we successfully passed the constitutional amendment um, and changing the constitution, although we still have to fight for funding every year. Um, but changed that constitution. And then I went to go work um, as a local health department um, tobacco prevention program manager uh, for St. Lucie County Health Department. And I did that for nine years. So probably doing a lot of the work that the coalition's doing, working with youth, working um, with creating tobacco-free policies, um, working with coalitions and community partners and schools and colleges. Um, and then I had an opportunity to relocate to just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. So that's where I am tonight. Um, an hour earlier than you all, but I'm out here and I had an opportunity to work as the state um, program director for the statewide tobacco prevention program for the whole state of Tennessee. So I took my local work and put it on the state level. Um, I did that for two and a half years before coming to Catch Global Foundation, uh, which I've been here for three years. I came in uh, October 2017. And it's really great to be able to focus specifically on one particular topic um, that and see how this ever evolves and is ever changing. With most of our jobs, we always have multiple hats that we wear and we can't focus on one specific thing. Um, but to be able to work with the professor at the University of Texas um, Health Science Center who developed the program um, was a scientific editor on the Surgeon General's report um, in 2016. And to have some of those high level connections, it's just really exciting to push this program forward throughout the country. And then also, especially now working with Vermont, you guys um, you have implemented the program. We are in all 50 states. Um, so just a little intro. As the U.S. Surgeon General has stated, we know that the uh, problem of youth vaping has risen to the status of a national epidemic. Um, so in other words, before the pandemic, we're in a crisis with our students. And it's imperative that we continue to act quickly to stop this problem from continuing to spiral further out of control. Um, so I hope to provide you with some initial um, information tonight and pique your interest. Um, I know Allison's going to put a call to action out there. But we're going to be presenting again in, in the 19th. Come back. Please tell us what else and what other information you want to know um, so that we can dive into some of these little snippet of topics that we're just going to touch base on tonight. Um, so the e-cigarette sector of the tobacco industry is evolving at such a rapid pace. We know that new products are constantly entering the market. Um, Policymakers are scrambling to rein in the issue and new regulations are being put into place at local, state and national levels. Are they right regulations? We're gonna talk a little bit about that, about the limited flavor ban that could have been so much better to, than what we have actually in place. Um, but we're trying to, hard to keep up with everything. It's a common struggle, especially when we're dealing with a crisis. Um, so the information that you're receiving today is current as of um, this past month, December 2020, when the National Youth Tobacco Survey came out and we're still going through some of the data sets for that point, as well as the uh, Monitoring the Future Survey, which are two of the huge surveys that we use um, when we talk about e-cigarettes and vaping. So let's just start and talk about what are e-cigarettes. So let's define what an e-cigarette is, which is a battery powered device that heats and disperses a liquid so that it can be inhaled into the lungs. So we like to compare e-cigarettes to phones or computers. So whether it's an iPhone, an Android, a Mac or a PC, they all essentially do the same thing. They have the same parts. They just look different. We're going to learn the same thing applies to e-cigarettes. All e-cigarettes contain a battery, microprocessor, atomizer, and a cartridge or a tank. There are many variations on the mechanism, but the basic process is the same. The microprocessor senses a change in pressure when the user inhales on the end of the e-cigarette. 
the microprocessor then instructs the atomizer to activate the heater and vaporize the liquid. This is what the smoker inhales through the mouthpiece. The vapor is then drawn into the body the same way as a regular cigarette is. Vapor, as we know, is defined as a substance diffuser suspended in the air. So we sometimes think of it as like steam that comes from boiled water um, inside a tea kettle. Um, but we're gonna learn that vapor is not what's coming out of an e-cigarette, it's actually an aerosolized vapor. If you think of boiling a pot of water on the stove for spaghetti, well, it may take a long time for the water to boil. One, if you're looking at the pot to boil, it always takes a long time. But also if you don't put anything in it. So what do I do? I put some salt and some oil, it boils a lot quicker. Well, the same thing with um, e-cigarettes. There isn't any water in the e-liquid and it contains many different chemicals. That's why it's an aerosol that comes out. Think of the hairspray that you might've used when you're getting ready today and the hairspray that comes out or the room spray that comes out and where all those particles fall, it's an aerosolized vapor. It's the same thing that's coming out of the e-cigarette. So, um, so we like to use this really, we don't call it vapor and what is, and neither does CDC and, or any of the other scientists, it's an aerosol. But when you don't, you don't ever hear of a child saying, I'm gonna go aerosol. I'm gonna go vape, right? They're gonna they're gonna go vape. That's that's the common terminology. What we like to use at Catch Global Foundation as a definition for vaping is inhaling the aerosolized chemicals created through the heating of e-liquid in an e-cigarette. But that sounds just a little less innocent compared to I'm just gonna go out and vape. So now that you've seen, you know how they work, um, and you can let's see if you can identify what they actually look like. So say you're at home and you see the following school supplies laying around on your child's desk. What you might not realize is some of these are actually e-cigarettes. Can you just, you don't have to raise your hand or do anything, but just take a look at those and you know mentally make a note. What ones do you think are actually an e-cigarette and what ones could it actually be a pen, a highlighter or something else? Don't worry if you don't do so well because a lot of adults, because the market changes so frequently, are struggling um, to see what the devices look like. All the ones that are circled are e-cigarettes. So it's BC, F, G, and I, and J are vaping devices. Don't be surprised. I know some of them don't even look like it. They actually look like pens or something else, but those are e-cigarettes. So let's take a look at, now that you know what some of them look like, um, let's take a look at the history of e-cigarettes, the evolution. Where did they start? What did they originally look like? Um, generation one um, actually were disposable e-cigarettes. They were made to look and resemble like a traditional cigarette. They are intended to be used until the liquid runs out, and then at which point they are discarded and thrown away. Um, se second generation are vape pens. These are larger pen-shaped looking devices that can be recharged. Um, the third generation are tanks. I actually call them those really big, obnoxious ones. Um, they, are, they have a rechargeable battery and a large refillable cartridge. They're also called mods because you can break them open and modify some of the parts. Um, if you ever heard of the national vaping competitions where they have the big cloud, it's a thing. If you haven't heard of it, there are national vaping competitions to see how big the cloud can get. Those are usually the devices because they can be modified that are used in those vaping competition. And then the fourth generation of e-cigarettes have a sleek high-tech design. They are easily rechargeable batteries, which have now entered the market. Um, you may have heard of this by now. The largest and the most popular brand of e-cigarette in this epidemic in the category is the Juul. So Juul uses small disposable pods that contain the e-liquid, and then it's inserted to the larger Juul device. A Juul device could easily be confused for a USB drive, and they can even be charged in laptops, computers, a lot of TVs now have a USB cord that you can plug in so you can share your pictures from your, from your phone on the big screen, or you can charge your jewel in it as well. Um, we even had stories of parents that would go and think that they're buying their child a USB drive because that's what their child is saying, but it's actually an e-cigarette. Um, they spawned their own terminology because, um, and it actually changed the National Youth Tobacco Survey data. Um, Students who use Juul, they don't consider themselves vaping or even using an e-cigarette, they're Juuling. And Juuling is just the slang verb that's only associated with a Juul. Um, in fact, some schools, students even refer to bathrooms as Juul lounges or Juul spas. If you can remember back in the day when you could go in, into the bathrooms and the people were smoking cigarettes, well, now they're vaping and they're calling them Juul lounges or Juul spas. But we also have now other copycat products, including Sorenjot, MyBlue, Smoke Nord Kit, that follow Juul's high-tech design 
and high nicotine delivery through nicotine salt e-liquid variations. Now we're gonna to go to a fifth generation, unfortunately. We had that limited flavor ban, which we're gonna talk about, um, that has banned the dual pods from becoming in flavor. But now these are the new disposables. Um, they're more high sleek design of a disposable e-cigarette compared to what generation was with, one was. They have that high nicotine concentration and currently this type of e-cigarette is not part of the flavor ban and comes in a lot of different flavors. In fact, according to the 2020 National Youth Tobacco Survey, so it's a survey that's administered from CDC every year. Luckily, we were, they were able to administer the survey through January through March of 2019, so we have this data. The pre-filled, or 2020, I'm sorry, the pre-filled pods or cartridges are the most used e-cigarette device among high school students and middle school students. So those were those pre-filled jewel pods. But then disposables followed right behind that. And we're gonna talk about the disposable epidemic that we're in with our students um, in just a minute. We also have vaping accessories. So to make the jewel and other vaping devices more fashionable, many companies have created cases for their phones, trendy hand-knitted vape sweaters um, that you can carry and they have lanyards. It can come in backpacks. Um, some of them look like phone chargers and it's actually for their e-cigarette. Um, but perhaps the most shopping was the emergence of clothing specially designed to conceal these vaping devices. Um, the picture that we have on the left, um, yes, is really, they claim they didn't market to young people, but she looks really young in that picture. Um, and it's actually a hoodie. So what she is um, inhaling on is a tube that is instead of the drawstring, for the, her hoodie, it's actually a tube that links to her e-cigarette and she can actually be hands-free. Um, and it's crazy because I actually thought, I'm like, do these things really exist? And it was, last, like it must, must not have been 2020, must have been 2019, we were at a park with my son and they were fishing and I saw this guy with a backpack on and he's fishing and he's got this thing hanging in his mouth. I'm like, oh my gosh, he actually has one. So it's, you know, is that student in school, are they actually sucking on their, their drawstring to their hoodie? Or are they actually using a vape because they're able to be hands-free? Um, this company also makes hoodies, backpacks, um, and it can be, um, so they can be used without raising attention for parents, teachers, or even other adults. This specific brand called Vaparware, um, in 2019, FDA had raised the concern about these type of products stating that they were used specifically for students and young people to hide their vaping from their parents or other adults. Um, so they put actions out um, to take them down and have them off the site. Uh, so you can't go to vape barware anywhere. The site is down, but there are mock-offs of this product, of course, that another company has. So they're still around and they, they, they still exist. And unfortunately, these accessories and add-ons make the Juul and other e-cigarettes seem more like a high-tech gadget than a vaping and tobacco device. So let's take a look at some of the root causes. How did we even get here? So we have some information, um, as was stated earlier, from 2017 to 2019 data. Um, this is national data. Um, so we're, uh, we also have this now from the 2020 National Youth Tobacco Survey that just came out. Um, and it's surveyed about 20,000 students from grades 6 through 12. Um, and it was done, as I said, between January and March of this past year. So while we did have a steady increase of youth using e-cigarettes from 2017 to 2019, and during that three-year span, we saw a 135% increase among high school students and a 218% increase among middle school students. The story has shifted slightly. Don't get too excited because you're wait till you see the next screen. Um, now 19.6, so just under 20% of high school students, um, which is about 3 million or one in five, and about 5% of middle school students, which is about 50, half a million, 550,000, or one in 20 report current e-cigarette use. That means they currently use it within the past 30 days. Um, while this shows an actual decline, what has actually increased is the frequent and daily use rates for both middle and high school are still unacceptable and they've actually gone up. In fact, among current e-cigarette users, um, almost 39% of high school students and 20% of middle school students reported using e-cigarettes on 20 or more of the past 30 days. Um, what's even more shocking is that almost 23% of high schoolers and almost 10% of middle school 
report using daily use. So what we're seeing is a trend of, while well, there's not an increase of more students that are using e-cigarettes, but the students who are using e-cigarettes are becoming addicted and using it more frequently. So, you know, if you've had to step away, you know, if you're making dinner or if you had to go take care of the dogs or the kids, come back, take a look at this. This is not a mistake. We are in a disposable e-cigarette epidemic. Remember that category five that I talked to you about? Well, we have seen an increase from 2019 to 2020, a thousand percent increase in high school students using disposable e-cigarettes and a 400% increase in middle school students using disposable e-cigarettes. What does this mean? That limited flavor ban, which we're gonna talk about again in just a little bit, that limited flavor ban only did the jewel that was the highest most used um, e-cigarette among middle and high school students for several years. Well, then we had the limited flavor ban to where all pre-filled pods could not only come in um, tobacco flavor or a mint flavor, menthol, sorry, menthol, which is basically mint anyway, uh, or menthol flavors. So students have gone to, brought on a whole new market of puff bar and other e-cigarettes that are disposables that aren't part of the flavor ban and that are still widely available. Um, in fact, um, where do I don't have that data? I do have a data point too that shows how many students are actually start with, um, the flavored e-cigarettes. Um, it's an upward of 80%. So where um, it was mentioned earlier, the increase from 2017 to 2019, I think it was up into the 50s. Well, now we've jumped to over 80% of students who use e-cigarettes use it because they're flavored. So another data point is taking a look at vaping as an on-ramp to smoking. Is this true? So um, there was a study by the University of Pittsburgh found that um, almost 48% of those who used e-cigarettes at baseline began smoking cigarettes within 18 months compared to just 10% of non-e-cigarette users. In fact, the scientific model shows that an e if someone's using an e-cigarette, it made it 6.8 times more likely that an individual is gonna begin smoking cigarettes within 18 months. Um, and in fact, um, the 2019 survey data, as I said, we're still reviewing some of the newer data, but they reported that one in three reported using two or more tobacco products in the past 30 days. Um, and we know that the tobacco industry has also um, bought into some of the e-cigarette industry as well. So why do teens vape? What's, what, what is it about it? If they know it's bad for them, why do they do it? Um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, so NIDA, conducts a survey um, every year called Monitoring the Future. So this is a 2019 data because we're still looking at the raw data set from the 2020 data set that just came out in December. Um, but the number one reason why students use an e-cigarette, they want to see what it's like, so just to experiment. Number two is because it tastes good. Hmm. Could that have to do with all the different flavors? There's upwards of 8,000 different flavors that are out there. That's probably why it tastes good to them. And then tied with number in number three is to have a good time with my friends and to relax or relieve tension. Um, it's important to note that to relax or relieve tension increased from 2018 to 2019 by a third. Um, I'm curious to see where this is in 2020, especially since we had this uh, the pandemic that we are in. So what do teens say in their e-cigarettes? Do they even know? Um, so this is a, a figure from the National Institutes of Health shows the knowledge gap the students have about e-juice. Um, so we, we not only see that just about 14% of teens don't know what's in their e-cigarette, but 66% believe it's just flavoring. Um, and we know that there's many different flavors and chemicals that are in e-cigarette vapor. And more than likely there is nicotine. In fact, according to CDC, 99% of e-cigarettes sold do contain nicotine. In fact, some of those ones that say they do not contain nicotine, that they're nicotine free, have traces of e-cigarette, of, of nicotine in them. So another major issue, you know, compared to the marketing that we had back in my day of traditional cigarettes to where you see the Brad Pitts or the movie stars that are using the, eat the traditional tobacco products is the other type of marketing, which is huge on social media. Um, seven in 10 kids are regularly exposed to e-cigarette advertisements. And this just shows a quick breakdown of where that actually happens. Um, we know that product placement laws have been passed, um, including tobacco products to be behind the counter, not for individual sale, not placed next to youth appealing sales like candy. Uh, but now the e-cigarette industry has picked up that market share and are doing the same exact thing. Um, 
not surprising, the high rate of um, youth who see e-cigarettes on the internet, followed by TV, including streaming, um, streaming shows or movies. Um, and then let's not forget those video game streams as well. So it's really important that we teach the kids to recognize e-cigarette ads, um, which can be stealthy and subtle in social media to understand when they're actually being sold something. Um, think about your own social media use or your children's use. We can control who, um, who, follow, who we follow and who follows us, but we can't control that advertising that pops up. It's um, gotten really, really bad on social media. So this is some of the things too that might actually, um, irrit it irritates me a lot to see some of this stuff. Um, some of the advertising that's happened on social media. If you look at the um, social media, that was a huge thing now. That's um, TikTok even, that's where kids are seeing different types of advertisement that kids are doing. Um, we're gonna talk more about that in another session. Um, so come back. But this is just to give you a little snidbit of what happens and what is happening. Remember that little, that little thing that we did earlier about can you identify what is a vaping product what's an e-cigarette well the marketing companies are doing the same thing now if you take a look at that picture on the left that fits by your child's makeup it could be an eyeliner could be mascara no that's actually an e-cigarette um, and then really disturbing is this the smoke um, brand of e-cigarettes they're not the only ones um, but they took the whole pandemic. You notice he's wearing a mask. You take a quick look at the table. There's um, toilet paper and hand sanitizer. Um, there's even companies that were offering a free mask with purchase, um, which is really disgusting. And then a bitty vapor actually claimed on Instagram that a bitty stick a day keeps the pulmonologist away. Really? So what affects a vaping? So what do we know about vaping? So we know that it is an unhealthy habit. Um, so let's start about addressing some of the short-term effects that can have long-term consequences. Addiction. So we're all born with the potential for addiction and it manifests in different ways, whether it's alcohol, nicotine, social media, exercise, caffeine, chocolate. Um, but what's unhealthy about e-cigarettes is that using nicotine in adolescence can harm the parts of the brain that control attention, learning, mood, and impulse control. And we know that nicotine, it's a toxic, colorless, yellowish, oily liquid that's a cheap active component in tobacco. Um, it can act as a stimulant in small doses, but in larger amounts, it blocks the action of nerve and muscle cells. Um, nicotine is also used in insecticides. So one of the important things to note that nicotine can be absorbed through the skin. So if you do see an e-cigarette product, you really take caution in handling them because they can leak and that nicotine can be absorbed through your skin. So to understand how addiction works, let's take a look a uh, little bit of biology. Each time a new memory is created or a new skill is learned, stronger connections or synapses are built between brain cells. Young people's brains build synapses faster than adult brains. Um, and nicotine changes the way these synapses are formed, which interfere with the brain's sensitive pleasure and rewards feedback loop. Because of this, nicotine in adolescents may also increase risk for future addiction to other drugs. Um, it's important to note that just until recently, Juul was a leader in the vaping market with incredibly high nicotine concentration at 5% in just one pod, which is the same amount of nicotine in an entire pack of cigarettes. But now other e-cigarette brands, including Puff Bar, that comes in many different flavors and are disposable, are coming with that high nicotine concentration. Um, and since we know the human brain continues to develop until the age of about 25, we really need to prevent youth and young adults from ever even picking up the habit. We know the vapor produced and inhaled when using an e-cigarette from Juul, disposable e-cigarettes is not harmless. In fact, it can contain, often contain many harmful ingredients. And so while generally vapor contains fewer harmful chemicals than smoke from burnt tobacco, it's important to keep in mind between the difference between less harm and harmless. So I like to use this analogy. Jumping out of a third story window will cause less harm than jumping out of the 10th floor, but neither one is harmless. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. We know that e-liquid um, that is heated um, and, and becomes inhaled as vapor, it's the same thing with the Juul device. These e-juice contain cancer-causing chemicals, including heavy metals, such as nickel, tin, and lead, and almost always contains that nicotine-derived component of nicotine. Marcella, while you're taking a sip. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, wow, it's so much wonderful um, information to, to take in, and I know there's so much more, um, so much learning. Um, there's a few minutes left um, of this, this 
part. I don't know where you're where you're at, but keep it going, and then we'll. All right. Well, well I can leave. Questions. Questions. So, you know. I'll leave this little yeah. brief thing now, and again, we're going to yeah. go into more details at the next um, presentation. So, Great. a couple of things just to note, um, and I'll go through these next slides, but rather quickly. Um, but is before COVID, you know, there was great concern over vaping associated lung illness. Um, and FDA came out with that warning in April of 2019. One of the big things to note is that it is still a concern. Um, but not only that, is that we know that um, conditions of using um, e-cigarettes often present like pneumonia or even COVID, so that you need to make sure if you have those symptoms or if someone you love has those symptoms, see a doctor and let them know that vaping has been, um, that someone's been vaping. The important thing here that I want to know is that in August of 2020, a study from Stanford University found that those who vape are five times as likely to contract COVID-19 as those do not. And to compound this, if you vape and smoke traditional combustible tobacco products, you're seven times as likely to contract COVID-19. That in itself should be a reason not to use an e-cigarette. So there are different resources that I'm gonna go through these rather quickly just because of time. Identify signs that your teen might be vaping. Behavior changes, are they anxiety? Are they, do they have a lot of mood change? It might not be the teenage years, they could have issues with nicotine withdrawal. Difficulty concentrating, change in eating patterns, including weight loss or weight gain. Mouth sores and dry mouth around because of the inhale of the vapor. Unexplained nosebleeds. Um, in your home, they may decide to start to wear perfume or cologne or even burn scented candles or incense in the room to hide that smell of the flavored tobacco product. Um, talk to your kids about vaping, keep it an open conversation. One of the key things here that I do wanna mention, there's, there's resources here for them to quit. Um, this was actually published on the Surgeon General's, um, on the Surgeon General site, talk with your teen about e-cigarettes. Um, but one of the key things is don't start the conversation with we need to talk. So I know anytime anyone tells me that, I'm like, what did I do wrong? Bring up an event or something that's happened about e-cigarettes or what you've learned about e-cigarettes and have an open conversation and keep that conversation going. Um, check in with them, know where they are, know who they're with, when they're gonna be there. Keep them involved in school events, make connections, know the kid, your children's friends and their parents and set rules um, in regards to curfews and supervision. Um, and then keep them busy, enroll in school activities, little different now compared to where we are. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and bypass this, but there's more information about this and I can share it with you, Allison, and so you can send it out to the group because we have a whole worksheet with the Catch My Breath program for parents. Um, the limited flavor bands. So these are some of the things that are about the um, puff bar, the disposable e-cigarettes that are out there that are not covered um, by the flavor band that's out there now. And um, as was mentioned earlier, the 2020 National Youth Tobacco Survey stated that almost 83% of youth used flavored e-cigarettes. So almost 85 in high school and almost 74% in middle school students. This is why we need to ban flavored e-cigarettes altogether. We talked about raising the age of sale of tobacco products from 18 to 21 across the country. So it's not only Vermont, it's everywhere. And last but not least, what can you do to get engaged? Of course, contact your, you know, your partners here with the Coalition at Healthy Limo Valley. If you wanna get involved in advocacy, there's Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and PAY, which is Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes. Talk to other parents, get involved with your school and advocate for education and prevention at your school with the Catch My Breath program. That's free and that's it. Wow, Marcella. This was a huge amount for an introduction and so much information. I'm hoping that uh, the folks who are here um, have learned something and have some questions. So please put some questions in the chat box as well as what topics you'd like to know more about because this presentation is much expanded for our January 19th uh, presentation. And I did want to mention, I, I think Dan Noyes, a local representative joined just a few minutes ago, right at the time when Marcella was talking about moving tobacco, um, the age of being able to purchase from 18 to 21. And, and Dan was a huge ally. So thank you, Dan, um, for all the work that you do um, for substance prevention and um, especially on the tobacco and vaping issues. So we have some limited time, but I wanted to one, put in the chat box, um, Marcella, do, oh great, I'm putting in the chat box a link to where we have data 
um, that's uh, on our website as part of our um, community planning toolkit. So you can access really any of the data, not just Lamoille County data, but I know there are folks from other counties in the Lamoille Valley. And um, you know, you can really get into what the data is in your um, the, the countywide data, but also on the district level and, and, and other places. So we can help support um, folks in that. And the main part that I want to do now is just, just fill in a couple of gaps in data and get us thinking about what we can do. So this is really to educate us and to launch us into um, our youth and young adult vaping prevention work group as part of our tobacco prevention task force. So, you know, as you're here, I know many of you work in the schools or are connected, have, have young people or in the legislature or community members who are interested, youth who are on the call, please, um, you know, start also putting any ideas in the chat box of what you think the priorities of our work group should be locally. Um, and while you're thinking and doing that, I'll just share a couple of data points with you. Um, so this is some pages from our community planning toolkit that you also can find online um, and just really kind of like the overview of the risk factors and the community level risk factors that lead to um, early onset of folks using substances and then um, some of our data um, that's local. So next one, Brian. Uh, this is from our, our um, most recent YRBS data. You can see the trends. I just want to show you compared to the other substances. This is, um, you can see over time. So, you know, when 2015, when ele electronic vapor products, the EVP started going, um, you know, introduced and then, you know, went up and, you know, is now, um, you know, about 26 percent or you know, that was in 2019. But you can see where the trend is and the um, like kind of exponential growth. Next slide. Um, here, youth substance use before age of 13. This is our, um, our local data. And you can see that flavored tobacco is higher than the other substances. Next slide. Um, I should also mention that Nate Bickford, who I hope is still on the call, but he's a, a youth coalition member, also created many of these slides, um, looking at the data and getting into it and creating the graphs. So, you know, the youth involvement and getting youth more connected and uh, doing things that they do well and, um, and bringing them to you. So this comes from our youth. Um, past 30 day use, we did talk about this. This is comparing some substances. Next one, please. Uh, this we've also heard, but this looks at the 30 day use also compared to the ever use. Um, and you can see three quarters of the current um, users in 2000, this is 2019 use Juul, as we heard from Marcel, you know, that has shifted because of their flavor ban and now the, um, the puff bars and the disposable products, which also I talked to some legislators last year on our um, action day for our tobacco prevention youth groups. And um, there were some of our legislators talking about how much of an environmental concern, you know, that also is. Um, please, next slide. Um, of high school students who vape, you can see that, um, that over on the right side, those who use six or more days a month um, is pretty high. And so I think that um, is something to think about as we're working on this locally, um, those who do vape are va vaping a lot and also the access and availability um, is higher than other substances. Brian, next slide, please. Uh, this shows the access, ease of access and also how much um, folks, uh, young people are seeing advertisements in our gas stations, supermarkets markets, and convenience stores, which leads to the next slide which um, there's this really great resource, the story map, which you can find on the link that I put for data. And um, it, you know, I, I really encourage folks to go there to see, we did some um, community surveying um, across all of Vermont. Um, each coalition worked on this and we were able to ask lots of questions about tobacco, alcohol, um, you know, went to all of the retail spaces and tracked it. So this is one that I chose to put, but looking at Lamoille County, at least you can see where the counties are, um, you know, it does have, uh, a, you know, high retail density of tobacco and that went along with um, lower, um, lower income. 
And so just you can see where our county is with respect to the, um, the retail density. And there's lots that policy, um, local municipal policy, we, we, can, we can have an impact. So Brian, we're good sharing. Now maybe the next slide. So I'm so excited to you know, bring people in um, to our youth and young adult vaping prevention work group. And so we really wanna take some time now towards the end of the meeting to talk about what are some of the priorities and or action items that this group um, you know, should consider or should work on. You know, what, do you, what would you like to see happen from whatever role you play in the community, um, you know, as a parent, as, you know, we have multiple identities also. So try to think on that. This is just the launch of it, but um, if you can, we can take a couple of minutes of quiet just to put in the chat box, any um, ideas you have of what you think you would like us to do to um, reduce youth vaping locally. We know that with combustible tobacco, you know, that it has um, usage has gone so way down, but vaping has gone up. And so a lot of the work that was done, um, now we're, we're kind of having to do all again. Some ideas that, that we could be doing, we already are doing. There are tobacco prevention youth groups in um, the schools and in gaining, it's a little tough during COVID, but we have some great um, school SAPs and counselors out there who are really doing their best to engage youth. We have health um, and PE teachers and folks who are um, in collaboration with, with us and sharing information who are, um, who are gonna be using this curriculum and other curricular pieces in the community. Um, there are marketing campaigns, social media and other that we could be doing. There's um, municipal policy advocacy, um, education that we can educate our, our local um, municipal leaders, but also our um, state legislators. Great, I see we could be doing YouTube multimedia um, and we can share, there's lots of information. I, I would say also we've been posting a lot on our own Facebook page at Healthy Lamoille Valley. So if you haven't liked us, like us and a lot of the information. Um, Saudia, please unmute yourself. Hi, good evening. I'll turn on my camera too so you guys can see me, sorry about that. Um, no, um, I was just gonna say that, um, something that we can do in our community. I, I feel like when we talk about health and wellness and substance use and abuse and misuse, I feel like uh, something that is missing is, is we, we talk a lot about self-care, but also community care. And I feel like as identifying why, um, why the youth are using um, some, it's because of their, what they're, what they're exposed to exposure. And as we're talking about the ads and their people in their families who are using their peers, et cetera. And for some, they are self-medicating and coping with other, you know, with other things. And I feel like until we address all of those aspects, like it's one thing to just say, okay, well, let's not use, but also talk about the other things that they're experiencing that they're not going to be so forthcoming with, um, because they don't even, they can't even identify those things, right? Yeah. <laughs> because they don't even know. Absolutely. And so I, I feel like like that's a huge part that is missing, and yep. that's even only for youth, that is also for adults. Um, when we're talking about these things, why, why do people use? And we talk so much about, you know, recovery. I'm a recovery coach. We talk so much about recovery and these things. And, but what we, we, we have to look at people's lives and all aspects, because we are whole human beings and all of those different dimensions of people, their environment, their, their finances, their safety, their housing, their job, there's so many things that are in, encompassed in that. And what's happening is it's trickling down into the young people, right? Because then they're saying their parents are overwhelmed and stressed out. They can't handle their stress. They don't know how to manage their stress. So these children are trying to manage new school systems, you know, COVID-19. They can't see their peers. They can't, hang <laughs> you know, and they're- oh, yeah. Thank you so much. I know before seven, you I hope that you'll stay on. Um, before seven, we um, want to just wrap up the coalition meeting part and then can have more conversation. But this is really wonderful to, and to be get continued and so important. That's why I actually asked Marcella specifically to put in that data that was about why students are vaping and, um, and that we need to get at that and, I, you know, and really bring youth into this. Like this cannot be led by 
by adults. You know, how do we, and we have a youth council and Brian is, um, you know, our youth coordinator, but really working in coalition with other groups like Real, that you're involved in our Racial Equity Alliance and finding commonalities to work on all of the broader issues, um, you know, and re really look at pre prevention with the, um, with the, with the broad oh, perspective. Allison, I just, yeah. I just want to say, uh, you're totally right, Saudia, and um, the work that we do in prevention is really based in the research and it, it's about um, risk and protective factors. So um, at the Healthy Lamoille Valley, we actually do, we look at the data all the time and we do really extensive um, assessments. And um, there are risk factors that um, really are closely tied. I mean, there's so many risk and protective factors, but there are risk factors that are really Closely, closely tied to um, use and and early onset of use, and so um, we actually do that work in Healthy Lamoille Valley and going through the data and identifying what are the risk factors specific to our community, and all of the strategies uh, that the coalition does are addressing those risk factors. What what the data is showing is leading young people in our community to use. But um, yeah. I mean, spot on as always. Yeah, I and I would add to Michelle and Sadia that, you know, we're looking at risk and protective factors and Sadia, you know, as I think it was Mark, others are writing the protective factors and, um, for sure. Healthy the Moyle Valley specifically works on the outer systems, more systems and community level of those risk and protective factors. So we can also share in the follow-up some information relating to risk and protective factors risk and protective factors that you know folks can see all the ones that are like on the personal relationship, in the in the um, you know, and as an individual, and just how on the community level, you know, it's looking at what the community as a community and those systems can do to um, to address the risk and protective factors. But this great start to a conversation. I know that um, Jessica is going to jump in here. Um, but and then while she's on, I'm going to put in a link to the registration for the January 19th meeting. And um, anyone who wants to follow up with me about joining into this task force and work group, um, you are welcome. And I hope that you um, you join us. And thank you so yes. much to Marcella. Yes. And we'll see you again January 19th. Thank you for so, having me, appreciate it. So, so pass it to Jessica. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and I just wanted to draw your attention um, that, to the chat. Um, that we, I just dropped a link in there. It's a really short survey, seriously, two to three minutes, because this is a new process for us to have these coalition meetings in this format and to have them monthly. And so we really wanna like tap into those things that, that you wanna talk about and, and learn from you. Um, this is actually our third meeting in this format. So just before we get too far out, we really want to get feedback on what do you like about these meetings? What could we do different? There was a few people that you know skipped, you know, already commented and, and were really honest and, and we want that honesty. So please take a moment to, to do that survey. Um, our next meeting will be on the 2nd of February at the same time slot. Um, and it's really just gonna be, how do you talk about prevention? How do you talk about these issues? And it's really gonna be much more, um, um, less pre presentation and more just conversations um, because that's one thing that people are, you know, really want is those conversations and opportunity. So some meetings are gonna be more heavy on presentation. Some meetings are gonna be more heavy on opportunities to connect and, and really uh, share what, what you're experiencing and, and get ideas and, and generate that energy from each other. So the next one is how do you talk about prevention? What are some ideas? What's worked for you? Um, and that link um, will also be available. I'll send out an email in the next two days uh, with the materials from tonight, as well as the link to the register for the next meeting. Um, but also know that, um, we as staff, um, Brian, Allison, and myself, we love to connect with you. So you don't just have to connect at the coalition meetings. We'll gladly set up one-on-one -on -one meetings. You know, we want to hear your stories. What are you experiencing? How do you, how can we support you in prevention? Because you're really living this as parents, as teachers, as you know, legislators. You know, at wherever you are, what your sphere of influence is. 
you know, you have opportunities and we'd love to support you in, in that. Um, our web, website is constantly evolving. We're on Facebook and Twitter. I think uh, the youth have an Instagram. Um, Brian's building the youth council back up. So uh, if you know students who might be interested in, in making a difference and who just don't want to feel alone in their like, you know, choice not to use substances. You know, sometimes it can feel like everybody you're with is using substances, but really the the majority of students are not using or, or misusing substances. So it's, you know, tapping into and learning that, like, hey, there's other kids out there. So um, I'm seeing a, a question um, from Sadia of, are youth who self-disclosed penalized? And I think, you know, I, I don't know if any of our SAPs um, would want to, to share that or to share their take on it, or if you're meaning in, in youth council. So um, that's a really great question. Um, it's, it's our hope that youth would not be penalized, but would get help. Um, if and we're also if working that. on restorative approaches with schools. And I know a lot of schools are working on restorative approaches, but I don't, I don't know. Bethany, are you out there and willing hey, to share or Marta? Hey, Crystal, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I am right here. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I have a seven year old who's ready for bed. <laughs> um, so, youth are not penalized for self disclosing unless they are caught using, and then we have to follow our nicotine and tobacco, and we thank you, um, policies and procedures. But we, as Allison said, we are moving towards more restorative approaches. So, this um, may not look like a suspension. This might look like doing some restorative work within our school community. Thank you. Hi. Good. Hi, and this is Margo uh, for the SAP at PA, and I am in agreement with Bethany that uh, uh, students who self-disclose would, would not be uh, penalized and really working on the restorative aspect of uh, you know, how we work with our students and move them forward and educate. Yeah, and we're really working to create a supportive environment within the coalition as well. And so really, you know, not wanting to, you know, have people feel penalized or, or ostracized if they do self-disclose. So, um, and if you see ways that we can do better at that, please let us know. Um, so technically our meeting is over. We always welcome, we have about a half hour that's not scheduled. So if anybody wants to stick around and, uh, and chat, um, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, and uh, Brian just dropped uh, the kickoff flyer for the Youth Council in the chat too. So, so I know many of you have been on Zoom all day. So <laughs> thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much. And thanks for all the support, um, especially from our school partners and all the work you're doing.